Today is the 22nd of September, uh, 2014. We are at the New York State Military Museum in Saratoga Springs, New York. My name is Wayne Clark. Sir, for the record, would you please state your full name and date and place of birth, please? My name is Harold Grant, born August 14th, 1926, in Grand Gorge, New York. This is over in Delaware County. Did you attend school there? Yes, I did, through the uh, eighth grade, mm -hmm. and then we moved to near Oneana, uh, started ninth grade at Charlotte Valley Central School. Okay, and, and did you graduate from high school? Yes, I graduated from Schoharie High School. We moved to Schoharie County in Central Bridge in 1942 and I graduated from Schoharie High School. And what year did you graduate from high school? Uh, 45. 45. I, I left to go in service and got my diploma after I got back. Now, were you drafted or did you enlist? Oh, I enlisted. And uh, why did you pick the uh, Army Air Force? Well, there's two reasons. I uh, wanted to become a pilot. Mm -hmm and I didn't want to be in the infantry, <laughs> so Good reason. that left the logical reason to I joined the Cadet Corps at the age of 17 mm -hmm. in 1943 and uh, with the idea of going to either pilot, bombardier, or navigator school mm -hmm. and was called to active duty on the 25th of January of 1945. Now how did your uh, parents feel about you going into the service? Uh, Particularly my mother was not happy about it mm -hmm. at all. Uh, mothers were, yes, sure. but uh, it was, everybody was going in. At mm -hmm. that time, it was the thing to do. It was, uh, mm -hmm. We did, were at war and uh, it was the mm -hmm. thing to be doing. Did you have any other family members or relatives that were in? I had a couple of uncles that were in, mm -hmm. yes. Okay. and. Uh, where did you go for your basic training? Uh, Fort Dix, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. uh, was, I, that, was that your, probably your first time away from home? Yes, as a matter of fact it was, and I remember very clearly uh, January 25th, the date I went in. Uh, we left early in the morning uh, from Central Bridge to go to Schenectady to get the train, mm -hmm. and it was a horrible storm. Uh, in Duanesburg, they was a one-lane travel for a ways through canyons of snow that had been eaten out by the rotary snow plows. And uh, we arrived at uh, Fort Dix about 10 o'clock at night. Mm -hmm. There was at least a foot of snow on the ground and the wind was howling and mm -hmm. the snow was blowing horizontally. And of course we uh, immediately were issued our uniforms, overcoats, and so on and so forth, and then marched to our barracks. And by that time, it was about midnight. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, they had fed us. We, I had my first meal, which was a uh, stale cheese sandwich that had been made sometime in the morning, probably, <laughs> and, and a, uh, an apple. So that was my first meal in the Army. Uh -huh. uh, let me go back just a little, little bit. Do you remember where you were and what you were doing when you heard about the attack on Pearl Harbor? I was living in Davenport Center at the time mm -hmm. and uh, don't remember what I was doing okay. when I first heard about it. No, I do not. Did life change after that? With the uh, rationing and oh, people yes. going sure. into the service? Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. It was, uh, the whole country was geared uh, toward war at that mm -hmm. time. Uh, unlike today, uh, everyone was aware of it and mm -hmm. uh, made aware of it because of rationing of sugar, tires, sure. gasoline, mm -hmm. and so on. Yeah. Now, uh, you're in basic training. Uh, were there anybody there with you that uh, that you knew from back home or from Albany or 
No, I, they were all new to me. I didn't take basic training at Fort Dix. I was only there, that was a reception center. Oh, okay. I was only there for a week and then I was sent to Keesler Field, Mississippi for basic training. And was that aviation oriented? Oh yes, basic? yes. Okay. it was Keesler Air Base and uh, interesting trip to get there if you're mm -hmm. interested I could tell you about sure, it. Sure, sure. Uh, we were assigned a car on the train mm -hmm. and the one I was assigned to was the last car on the train and the back half of that had been like a president's car with a porch on the back and uh -huh. brass railing and all that uh -huh. and comfortable chairs to sit in that uh, large picture windows in the car. Front half of it was where we slept and the back half was this lounge uh -huh. car type of thing. So we had a lot of visitors from the other guys on the train that would come back to look at a, the car that I was assigned to, but uh -huh. I, I just got lucky on that. In fact, I remember once we arrived in Alabama and the soil was real red, uh, the weather was real warm, though it was January, uh, we put a couple of chairs out on the back deck and our feet up on the brass railing and <laughs> really enjoyed the trip. <laughs> uh -huh. uh, sure. Now, what was your basic training like once you got settled uh, in? Just was like most all basic training, a lot of calisthenics, mm -hmm. a lot of uh, PT. Mm -hmm. uh, Probably was the food there. Food was good. Mm -hmm. Food was very good. Uh, wherever, wherever I was stationed, I had no complaints about the food. Mm -hmm. In fact, when, one of the things I remember about Keesler for breakfast, I had little round balls of dough served with a green syrup. <laughs> what made it green, I don't know, food coloring, huh. it, but it was delicious. Huh. Never heard of that one before. And as far as the training is concerned, we had one fellow that uh, goofed off our barracks and didn't want to follow orders too well, so of course we all had to pay for that, so we were called out one hot night to do some calisthenics starting at about nine o'clock at night and uh, full full gear uh, with our packs and then hung our overcoats, our heavy overcoats over the packs to make it even heavier and we did PT for a full hour before mm -hmm. we were excused. Uh, he of course was made to pay for it at a later time by the rest of us. <laughs> All right. What happened uh, once you completed your basic training? I was uh, sent to Amarillo, Texas for A&E school, airplane and engine mechanic school, okay. and uh, arrived there, must have been about the first part of March. I, mm -hmm. I remember Easter, day before Easter Sunday, we were lying out on the grass in our shorts, absorbing the sun and getting a suntan and so on. And the next day we had two inches of snow on oh, the ground. Wow. So <laughs> the weather can change. Uh -huh. They say Amarillo is the only place where you can stand in mud up to your neck and have sand blow in your eyes. <laughs> mm -hmm. I guess there's some truth to that. Mm. So what was your, your training like there? Oh, it was daily school. Oh, mm -hmm. it was a school daily to learn all aspects of uh, airplane and engine mechanics. Now, what uh, type of planes were you working on? Mostly B-24s and B-17s. Mm -hmm. uh, we had some B-25s. Uh, the B-29 was not out mm -hmm. yet, hadn't been produced yet. Mm -hmm. So it was mostly 17s, 24s. We did have a P-38 Lightning uh, also mm -hmm. that we trained on. Now, how long was uh, the training? I was there uh, till just about the end of September of 45. Okay. So, from March till September of okay. 45. So, uh, by that that time, both the war in Europe and, and uh, Japan had, had ended. In 45? In 45, uh, yes. Mm -hmm. In June, in Europe, uh, it ended, and of course, the 
atom bomb mm -hmm. on August 14th was the end of the war right. in the Pacific. Now, do you remember uh, when you heard about the death of President uh, Roosevelt? I knew of it, but I don't remember any okay. specifics about okay. it. I've just been watching a series on television, an excellent series mm -hmm. on the Roosevelt's. Now, what about uh, when the war in Europe ended? Was there a lot of celebration? I guess there was, but yeah. not where not yeah. where we were on the base. It was mm -hmm. not widely celebrated. It wasn't like Times Square in New York City or right. anything. So you, you guys probably figured, okay, now we're definitely going to Japan, right? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. or, or somewhere in the Pacific, right. yeah. Some of our people went to uh, Guam. I initially went to Saipan. Mm -hmm. uh, we shipped out of uh, San Francisco and went to Saipan for a week and then on to Okinawa. Now you uh, you went over by uh, a troop ship? Yes, we had a brand new ship, just been built. We were the first ones to use it, called, huh. called the Marine Adder. And uh, we sailed under the uh, Golden Gate Bridge and got out a little bit further and mm -hmm. turned around and came back. It was a merchant marine crew and they were unhappy with their quarters. Uh, didn't have large enough portholes and so on. So we returned to San Francisco and was put up on Angel Island for three days. Uh -huh. So that gave us a chance to explore San Francisco. Oh. Uh, first time into Frisco from Angel Island, we hitchhiked uh, the entrance to the uh, Oakland Bay Bridge, mm -hmm. about 100, 150 of us in a group trying to hitch a ride and a truck driver came along with a flatbed tractor trailer, the kind you would haul bulldozers on, yep. and told us to pile on. Well, we piled on, we must have had 100 of us oh, hanging, hanging on wherever we could and hanging on yep. to each other. And across the bridge we went and into San Francisco, so that was my first entrance uh, into San Francisco. Hmm. Now, when the war had ended with Japan, you guys must have been surprised that you were, not only were you still in the service because they were discharging so many people, that uh, you, were, you were heading uh, to the Pacific, right? There were a lot of us because we were replacements. Mm -hmm. uh, we went to Kearns, Utah uh, before we shipped out. Mm -hmm. And that was an overseas replacement depot. So those that had been there for some time in the Pacific and were coming home, mm -hmm. we needed to replace them and take their place. So mm -hmm. no, it wasn't a real big surprise. Okay. So uh, <clears throat> now, where was the first place you you ended up? Did you stop in Hawaii at all? No, no, we went right on past Hawaii. We stopped in Saipan for a week, and. Uh, what, what was Saipan like at that point? We, we had tents that we were mm -hmm. in, pyramid tents, and we were basically just waiting to ship out, be quite same. honestly. We are not doing too much of okay. anything, just waiting to ship out, which we did after a week on a LST for a week. Mm -hmm. And in rough ocean, LST is not, <clears throat> not the ship to be on. Yeah, did and you get seasick? The, I didn't, but a lot of our people did. Uh -huh. They're flat bottom and uh, they rock a lot from side to side and when they come down everything just shudders because mm. it's just flat bottom. Yeah. So not the place to spend a week. <laughs> and uh, so you went to Okinawa? Right. We landed at Naha, mm -hmm. uh, which was the capital of Okinawa, which was totally destroyed. A lot of the buildings had been built out of concrete and it was just mm -hmm. piles of concrete rubble for the most part. Mm. Uh, understand how it's all built up and beautiful, yeah. but at that time there was nothing left of it really. Okay. And we were immediately trucked from Naha once we got off the ship to Kadena Air Base and that's where I was stationed for the rest of my tour. Okay. What kind of uh, living quarters did you have there? We had tents. Mm -hmm. uh, we were allowed to fix up our tents so we made some midnight requisitions of various building materials, plywood, mm -hmm. two-by-fours and so on and 
built within the walls of our tent, and uh, we had it quite comfortable, quite mm -hmm. honestly. Uh, now, did you have any problems with uh, insects or snakes or anything like that? No snakes, but insects, yeah. We mm -hmm. had uh, mosquitoes, of course, and we had the aerosol bombs, yeah. and we had mosquito nets to go over our bunks. Now, did, did you have to take the Adabrin for so you didn't contract malaria? Oh yes, yes, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. From the female Anopheles mosquitoes, uh -huh. I they call. That's where you get it. All right. So, um, at that point, you were an electrician. Yes. That, that was your job. Yes, I was classified as electrician to, for B twenty nines. Okay. Yes. Now you said initially you were with the Eighth Air Force. You went over as part of the Eighth. As part of the Eighth Air Force, yes. That later. Uh, was discontinued and uh, became the 20th Air Force. Mm -hmm. And then after the 20th, before I was discharged, it changed to the First Air Division. Do you want to? Do you want to hold up that shirt and sure. ju just hold it close to you, and just uh, I can zoom in on that insignia. This was the. Uh, Insignia of the 1st Air Division. Okay. Okay. And do you also have a, an electrician's patch? Can you show us that? Yes, this is of course, the 8th Air okay. Force, which was well known. And uh, this is for airplane and engine mechanic. Oh, uh, can you hold that up again? Sure. I, did, I missed that patch initially. But, uh, Symbolizes a cylinders on a rotary engine. Okay, all right. Which the B-29 had, it was the right engine. That's W-R-I-G-H-T. And uh, I don't believe we... Oh, okay, so that, uh, that other patch was on the other shirt, uh, evidently. Yes. The electrician's yes. patch. Okay. Yes. All right. It was a, it's a tower with uh, lightning bolts. Lightning bolts coming off it, symbolizing electricity. Okay. And we had, uh, we performed inspections on B 29s That was our job: fifty hour, hundred hour, mm -hmm. uh, two hundred hour inspections at a hard stand at Kadena Air Base. And one other fellow. Uh, and I were the electricians in our our crew. Now, did you have enough work to keep you busy? Oh yes, yeah. A, a lot of electrical problems. No, not really. But uh, in performing the inspections, there's mm -hmm. various steps you sure. go through, of course. And uh, we had a few problems, but not a lot. Mm -hmm. The B-29 was referred to as the flying solenoid because it was mostly electrically operated, mm -hmm. uh, all the controls and everything. Supposedly uh, they had a computer system on there? Mm, not really. No? Okay. No. no. Right. All right. Um, did you get to do any flying at all? Uh, not much. We uh, went up a couple of times with uh, pilots that would mm -hmm. They want to, probably wanted to make sure that we had done our job well and were willing to get on and fly in the plane with them. Uh -huh. But I remember once we uh, buzzed the field before we landed, uh, doing 325 mile an hour at about 35 feet above the runway, which was kind of fun and uh -huh. rather, rather exciting. But mm -hmm. uh, no, we did not spend a lot of time flying. Mm -hmm. Now we're a lot of the planes painted with nose art at all? Or yes, names? yes, various, mm -hmm. various. Uh, okay. Right. And, and how long were you there for? I arrived in uh, sometime in October of 45, probably mm -hmm. the middle of October 45, something like that and left in December of 46. Okay, so you were there for a little over a year. Yes. Uh, did you see many changes? Uh, did things change? Uh, 
where you were bivouac? Were you still in a tent? Or no, we eventually uh, had built Quonset huts, mm -hmm. and uh, so we did move into Quonset huts eventually. Did the runways become more permanent? No, they were they were good right from the beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of ground up coral mm -hmm. rock and made real good surfaces. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course the landing strip was black top. Mm -hmm. And uh, the roads improved somewhat. We spent quite a lot of time in our off time uh, driving around the island where we were allowed to. Uh -huh. uh, we did not meet many civilians, so we did not intermingle. We were not allowed to. They were kept on a part of the island by mm -hmm. themselves. The only time we saw the civilians was with those that worked in a, on our base mm -hmm. in the laundry or in the mess halls. And uh, they were friendly people. Mm -hmm. Did you get to explore any of the caves or any of the places yes. where the Japanese yes. has been held yes. up? Yes. Went, went to Suri Castle, for instance, and, mm -hmm. uh, and we still had some Japanese occasionally coming out of the caves, turning themselves in after mm -hmm. I got there. They had been hiding in the caves, and mm -hmm. every once in a while another one would show up. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, we had Japanese prisoners of war there too mm. that uh, were under control of the military that they had working doing various mm -hmm. duties. So was there still a lot of evidence of, of the battle? Oh yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. There was uh, the trees for instance, a lot of the trees were shredded and mm -hmm. it was pretty barren landscape really. Mm -hmm. uh, but I was able to get around a lot because I had a vehicle. Uh, when I first got there, I found a Japanese car that one of the guys coming back to the States had and he was willing to sell it for $50. So I bought it <laughs> and I uh, had it for a week and got thinking about how was I going to maintain it, where would I get any parts and so on. So. What kind of car was it? I mean, I it was Japanese. It, it was a Japanese civilian car, Datsun, I believe it was the oh, really? manufacturer. Oh, But I'm not positive on that mm -hmm. now. But after a week, I swapped it off uh, for a Jeep. Uh, hmm. We were allowed to take vehicles out of salvage yards if, oh. they, if they weren't complete. And uh, we could usually find one minor part missing on a vehicle. and. Mm -hmm. It became ours, so uh, we uh, I had this Jeep and uh, had it until one night uh, at an outdoor theater in our squadron. Uh, after the movie was over with, I went to get my Jeep and it was gone. How oh, somebody stole it? And, well, they didn't steal it. The uh, MPs from another squadron appropriated it because they wanted it and. Uh, so our uh, adjutant went after them and they, they got in trouble for being off their beaten path, so to speak, in our mm -hmm. squadron instead of in their own. And I'm not sure what happened to them. All I know is my Jeep was gone and I suspect some officer ended up with it probably. Oh, you, you didn't get it back? <laughs> didn't get it back, no. Oh. Now what about uh, <clears throat> entertainment? Uh, did you have any USO shows yes, we coming did. through? Yes, uh, we had a couple of USO shows. Can't recall the names of them now. One was a. Uh, you didn't see Bob Hope, right? No, I didn't see any yeah. of the mainliners. Mm -hmm. uh, one was an opera type of thing that. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I was not into opera at the time, so. <laughs> but um, I did see President Eisenhower uh, on Okinawa. He made a tour over there. Uh, this was uh, while he was still a general, I believe, before mm -hmm. he became president. He uh, did an inspection tour, and uh, we were given a presidential unit citation after that, evidently at his request. Mm -hmm. So 
But all in all, it was a, was a good experience. Yeah. And uh, most of us were in the same age group, 19, early 20s, and uh, made some great friends. Mm -hmm. Enjoyed it, really. Now, the, uh, the flying missions that they were, were flying, uh, of course, the war, war was ended, so I, I would imagine it was probably like a, a lot of uh, island hopping, uh, resupply missions, and that sort of thing. Yes, mm -hmm. and also the flight crews maintaining their flying status, their mm -hmm. proficiency, re re retain their flight pay, and mm -hmm. uh, keep up on their training. So, yeah, there were a number of flights. Various mm -hmm. islands, Guam, uh, Japan, so on, make uh, runs to bring in supplies. Now, were you uh, considered uh, uh, flight personnel or on flight status at all? As no, no, I was ground crew, uh, but strictly you as worked okay. as an electrician on B-29s. Mm -hmm. uh, got as far as sergeant, uh, that was my rank when I was mm -hmm. discharged. But no, uh, I was not flying. flying do, you, do you recall, uh, as a sergeant, what your pay was back then? I honestly don't. Okay. It, it improves somewhat sure. over, over the lower grades, of mm -hmm. course, but none of us got a great amount of pay. Right. But uh, we got three square meals a day, mm -hmm. <laughs> type of thing. And at that point, you know, money wasn't that important, I guess, mm -hmm. to us. Okay. Now, uh, <clears throat> you were discharged uh, December of 1946. Right. You went back to the States. Did you go back uh, again on the ship? Yes. I believe the ship was called the General Hodges, uh, as I recall, and we went back uh, to San Francisco via the Aleutian route up near the Aleutian Islands, mm -hmm. and it was freezing cold, I remember <laughs> that. Uh, we would huddle underneath the exhaust ventilators uh -huh. up on deck to, to get warm occasionally. And then we went by uh, troop train from uh, Frisco through Texas, El Paso, so on, back to New Jersey at Fort Dix for discharge, okay. and that was considerable different train than the one I went on when mm -hmm. I went to Keesler. This had the uh, troop cars with the bunks stacked uh -huh. three high and uh, crowded in. So we spent a week on that getting back to Fort Dix. Were there a lot of people being discharged at that point? Yes, yes mm -hmm. there were. Okay. And I remember being interviewed by a psychiatrist as a part of our discharge. That was mandatory. And he tried to encourage us to re-enlist, indicated that we had never had it so good, and that <laughs> immediately told all of us, I guess, that we want no part of any anymore, so yeah. we did not re-enlist. Okay. So there weren't any takers, huh? <laughs> not, not that I'm aware of, no. And uh, how did you get back home? By train again? Or did you...? Yes, by train, yeah. And Flying was not that uh, common mm -hmm. at that time. It was mostly trains that transported. So I'm sure your family was, was happy to see you. Oh yeah, <laughs> of course, yes. And I was happy at that point to get home too. So, so you were home in time for Christmas of 46? Uh, yes. Okay. Yes. Now, you sent us this picture of you on Okinawa. Can you hold it up close to you like that, and I can zoom in on it? Now this, obviously, is after we got our faucet huts for our quarters. Uh, no longer in our tents. Okay. All right. Okay, got it. Now, uh, once you got home, did you, uh, did you make use of the GI Bill at all? I did not, no. Mm -hmm. uh, mistake on my part. Mm -hmm. I should have. My father was a milk plant manager uh, for Sheffield Farms Company, had been for a number of years. And uh, so I went to work okay. where I had left 
from uh, work from the labor was still hard to find at that time and mm -hmm. they needed help so okay I went to work there now did you use it uh, the GI bill to, to buy a home or anything in later years or I used the uh, yes my first home I used the GI uh, mortgage mm -hmm. GI mortgage I believe it was five and a quarter percent at that okay. time yeah now, now, did you get married? Yeah, no, we, we got married uh, July 5th of 1952. Mm -hmm. uh, my wife and I have been together now for 62 years. Oh, God bless you. And, uh, <laughs> in 1952, I celebrated Independence Day for the last time and got married the next day. <laughs> but uh, we, we have a lovely family. We have four children. Mm -hmm. The current time, we... Uh, have 11 grandchildren and soon to be 13 great grandchildren. Wow. <laughs> so there'll be 24 grandchildren and great grandchildren total. Mm. Uh, one of our granddaughters is, I hope he's delivering in July. Uh -huh. So it's been good. We uh, mm -hmm. celebrated our. Uh, one of our granddaughters, our youngest granddaughter's birthday yesterday, as a matter of fact, she just turned 11. We have great grandchildren that are older than she is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But from four children, like, sooner or later we're going to find out what's causing this, I suspect. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, did you uh, maintain contact with anyone you were in the service with? Yes, a couple of them. One from Rochester, New York. Uh, he stopped to visit mm -hmm. after our discharge one day. He went with uh, combustion engineering and he was on his way to Albany. Uh, Lou Tarantello. Uh, Lou was a very devout Catholic who uh, found many reasons to pray while we were on Okinawa. Mm -hmm. uh, he didn't particularly like riding in the back of a Jeep at a high rate of speed around corners and turns. And um, mm -hmm. I guess the louder Lou prayed in the back, the faster I went type of thing. Uh -huh. But uh, and then there was the, my fellow electrician who was from Council Bluffs, Iowa. So some years ago, my wife and I took our motor home cross country to a trip to California and mm -hmm. we stopped to see Earl uh, in Council Bluffs on the way home and had a delightful hour too with mm -hmm. he and his wife, whom of course I had not met neither of us yeah. were married at the time. So uh, he's the only one really that uh, I maintain too much contact with. Was he still living? I don't know. At the time, I'm going back probably 12 years anyway, he had cancer at oh. that time and we wrote a few letters after that but then stopped yeah. and I, I, I don't know if he's still living or not. Okay. Hopefully so. Now did, did uh, you attend any reunions at all? No. Okay. Do you belong to any uh, any groups like the VFW or the Legion? I do not. We have an active VFW in Aldermont, where mm -hmm. I live now. Uh, we have an active Legion. Mm -hmm. uh, they uh, have a motorcycle group within the Legion, uh, and they do a lot of benefit rides and escorts for the flights to uh, Washington mm -hmm. of the veterans and so on. So they're active. I was active in motorcycling after I was discharged. We oh, had, were you? Yeah, I, we used to uh, have a lot of activities uh, on motorcycles. We used to play motorcycle polo as a fundraiser, for instance. What kind of motorcycles did you Harley drive? Davidson. Uh -huh. And uh, yeah, I had a number of Harleys. My last new one was a 1948 Harley, which was wow. a real beautiful machine. Love to have the, it today. The pan, were, the it, pan head, the first yes. year of the pan head. Well, this was an overhead. Oh, okay. This was an overhead, a 61 overhead valve. Oh, the knucklehead you had. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. And uh, 
it'd be worth more today than it was when I oh, bought it. Sure. Nice. Yeah. I'd like to have it back. <laughs> I don't blame you. But I, uh, I uh, rode fairly recently too. I'm 88 years old now, mm -hmm. and I uh, had a Honda that I bought that I rode on my 80th birthday, and decided I had enough riding. It was time to mm -hmm. give it up, and I gave that to one of my grandsons. You must have known John Splitgerber. Oh, I know him, knew John and his son Irv very mm -hmm. well. Uh, John used to do various stunts, and uh, he rode through a tunnel of fire at the polo game that we sponsored in Central Bridge. The last I knew in this new showroom uh, on Central Avenue in Albany, mm -hmm. the picture of it was there. Uh, he wanted a 40-foot tunnel. We built it out of poles and burlap, covered it with burlap, 40 feet long. We mm -hmm. made it in four sections. And uh, when we assembled it, put it, put them together, it ended up about 41 feet. It was a little longer. To but he wanted 20 gallon of gasoline poured on it. Oh my God. And uh, we put about, and he wanted it on the ground, not just for show, he wanted it on the ground also. So we put out about 15 gallon, I think, and we decided that was enough. We had the fire department there, of course, standing by. Now what year would, would that have been approximately? That would have been about 1948. Mm -hmm. And I was the, I was our club president at the time, so I'm the one that lit the match to touch it off. And immediately a huge ball of fire, and John started riding toward it. He uh, had a 45 cubic inch motorcycle of one of our members that he borrowed to, for the occasion. Uh -huh. He had a face mask on, a leather jacket and everything. And it was, we had pictures that show the whole audience with their backs toward it, mm -hmm. running away because the heat was so extreme. Mm -hmm. But he came out of it all right, and uh, but the gas tank ignited around the cap, and we put that out immediately, but he, the leather was shrinking on his arms. It sucked the oil right out of the leather, and it started shrinking immediately, and it was constricting, so we, we got that off. And he had to breathe once going through, and he inhaled some flames in his lungs. But other than that, he, he made it fine. He was ready to go again. <laughs> I remember one time in Scotia, he crashed through uh, a burning boards. Mm -hmm. And they do this often on television because the boards are sawn nearly through. He didn't want any any weakening of the boards. He, they were hardwood, he finally crashed through it, but he almost bounced back when he first hit them because they weren't partly oh, cut boy. through or anything. And uh, crashed through some plate glass, mm -hmm. cut his leg real bad once, I remember mm -hmm. that, even though he had no leather pants on. Mm -hmm. now, so he, he was a real daredevil. Oh, yeah, he was, he was quite a fellow. He, uh, he uh, rode bikes into his 90s. I think he uh, went out to the uh, annual Harley-Davidson owners group meeting at mm -hmm. the age of 93, I believe. And if I recall, I think he was 97 when he, when he passed away, so, mm -hmm. yeah. Now, is the son Irv still living? I don't know. Okay. I really don't know. Yeah, I've been on the bikes for, for a number of years, but uh, yeah, I, I bought my, well, I bought my first new Harley from Spitzies when they were way up uh, near Schenectady in the, the uh, I, I think it was probably their first shop that they had before, before they moved to the great big complex down well, on Well, he, he had a place on Main Street in Scotia, Mohawk, okay. Mohawk Avenue in Scotia. Prior to that, he had a place in Hoffman's. Then he came to Scotia. Then they moved to uh, Upper State Street, Central Avenue. Okay, yeah, that's where Albany Schenectady Road. That's where I knew them. From. Okay. Yeah. okay. Well, you're still a youngster yet. Oh, well. Wow. <laughs> I'll be 66 uh, next month. But. That, is, that is young. <laughs> Wayne, you're still a young man yet. Okay. Um, what else was I going to ask? Uh, oh, how do you think your time in the service changed or affected your life? I guess 
the discipline mm -hmm. of the service was good, good training. I'm sure I became more disciplined as a result mm -hmm. of it, uh, less carefree. It was uh, all in all a good experience as far as I'm concerned. I would quite honestly be for mandatory mm -hmm. uh, military training at the age of 18. A lot of us really haven't decided what we want to do with our mm -hmm. lives. We need a little more time to think things mm -hmm. over and uh, I, th I think it's, it's good. Mm -hmm. Good training, good discipline. You you learn. There are so many different trades yes. that were learned by people during service, and the camaraderie uh, with your fellow uh, men were is very very good, very desirable. Okay. One last question. Sure. Have you ever been to the uh, Homefront Cafe in Altamont? Go there frequently. Uh, the lady lady that runs it, Cindy Pollard, yep. is our uh, neighbor. Oh, is she? Yes. Well, I know Cindy well. I haven't I haven't been over there in a, a couple of years. But uh, when you see Cindy, tell tell her that uh, Wayne Clark said hello. I certainly <laughs> will. And uh, it's she does a great job. Oh, that she does. And uh, she really recently hosted some uh, Iwo Jima survivors. Mm -hmm. They had a Get together there, and uh, she does a real, real fine job. Yes. And the food is great. Oh, it is. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, thank you so much for your interview, Wayne. Thank you, and great meeting you. Likewise.